Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us um, at Tech Talk Series 2020, co-hosted by FMI uh, and CART, Center for Advancing Retail Technology. Uh, I'm Doug Baker, Vice President of Industry Relations with FMI. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not aware of who FMI is, um, as the Food Industry Association, we work with um, an assortment of the community from retailers to um, producers uh, to service providers supporting retailers, wholesalers, and producers like Mercatus, who's with us today. Um, and our focus is to, um, to drive for a, a, a more safe, um, healthier, more efficient, which we're all trying to find efficiencies today, um, consumer food supply. You know, and in a time like we're in right now, efficiency and health is, is um, a couple of really big topics. So we're going to try and talk a little bit through today about how we're, we're working with uh, partners like Mercatus and CART in order to be able to bring that for you, uh, the retailers and wholesalers and product suppliers. Just real quick, some house cleaning. Um, you know, we've got uh, FMI antitrust st statement. Um, just as a reminder that uh, FMI uh, agrees strongly in competition and, and therefore follows our nationals antitrust laws uh, to govern competition. Uh, we'll do our best in this conversation to avoid any topics uh, sensitive in nature to price fixing, um, uh, allocation of markets, or otherwise. Um, and so I just want to make sure that everybody understands that we appreciate competition. Um, this is sort of a, a journey for us. And, and Gary, I think if you can remember back in uh, January 2020, I, I, I like to now call the good old days of 2020. <laughs> um, you know, we we collected together as an industry at FMI Tech Midwinter and um, sat down and really talked about, you know, what were the things that the industry was going to need to think about um, and what were we going to need to do as the service provider community and association to support the industry as they went down this technology journey. Um, and, you know, boy, next thing we turn around and, and we're in the middle of COVID-19 and, and things are just accelerating at a pace that was just so unprecedented. Uh, that, that you just really couldn't um, imagine it, uh, that we would have been there in January uh, where we'd be today. Um, so one of the first steps that we, we took is, is sort of organizing what that looked like. And you can see the, the tech wheel that we have there on the various topics that we wanted to focus on. And one that really came to light pretty quick because of COVID-19 was fulfillment. And so in May, uh, we ran an FMI Tech Cart series around fulfillment, looking at the various uh, options that are available from customer fulfillment, micro fulfillment, um, and uh, to help retailers who were gonna need to pivot pretty quickly because e-commerce sales were, were um, just gaining speed so quickly. So, um, and then we're here today um, to extend that series. Um, and we'll, we'll be um, providing sessions um, from here through the balance of the, the course of the year on this, on this topic. The first four that are gonna be slated over the next couple of weeks um, first, uh, today you're here to, to listen in on e-commerce in the time of COVID-19, but we also are going to be talking about contactless uh, shopping and transactions, um, the digital imperative, what is it that we need to be doing to uh, meet today's demands, um, and then ultimately technology and health and hygiene during the pandemic. And, you know, we've, we've thrown in, it used to be health and wellness, and now it's health and hygiene, right? So it's about having our environment and being in control of the environment that we're around to improve our own health outcome and the use of technology that, that is enabling that. So as I mentioned today, we're gonna have e-commerce in the time of COVID-19, and I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce the two gentlemen that you see on the screen there with you. Uh, my co-host, Gary Hawkins, founder and CEO of CART, Center for Advancing Retail Technology, and Sylvan Perrier, President and Chief Executive Officer of Mercatus. Gary, why don't you go ahead and give everybody just a little bit of a background on CART. Sure, thanks, Doug, and, and uh, great to be with you today and, and Sylvain. So CART's mission is connect the food industry to new innovation. Uh, and we do that really through what we've developed as the innovation system. And that system is really comprised of three parts. It's first helping retailers understand what new innovative capabilities they're going to need to ensure future success. The second is then letting that drive a process for consistently sourcing new innovation in a fast changing world, right? Because we need to all understand and appreciate that this is not a one and done thing. 
that innovation technology are growing exponentially and so we have to view this as a process. And then lastly, and something that we're spending more and more of our time on, is really helping the industry and retailers in particular develop an organizational culture that is ready for a future that's arriving sooner than expected, right? The, this new world places new demands on organizations to move faster, be more efficient, be more effective in their decision making and deploying resources. So that's CART's role in this and, and happy to be uh, working with FMI to bring this series of uh, uh, webinars and, and learning to the industry. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Sylvain Perrier, our uh, uh, sponsor today from Mercatus. Sylvain? Gary, thank you very much. And Doug, always a pleasure to work with your team at FMI. And you know, what we do at Mercatus is something fairly novel. Really, we're helping grocers to get back in charge of their online shopping experience. And that's imperative in a time like this. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And we do that by empowering them to deliver these really strong, exceptional, rich media solutions that are branded with their name and their logos and that really touch at the heart of their consumers and making it that much easier for them to shop online. We're exclusively focused on the grocery retail segment, providing front-end solutions in an integrated SaaS commerce platform here in North America. Let's go to the next slide. Now, some of the Mercatus resources, we have our, our modern grocer's guide, as well as our website, mercatus.com. Now, coming in September uh, 15th of this year is our digital grocery shopper study. It is the largest ever conducted grocery e-commerce survey in North America with over, I think, 48 million data points. And most people know about digitalgrocer.com, our new website that represents our, I like to call it our world famous uh, podcast. Uh, we uh, just launched season four and we're also going to be doing uh, video as well. It's kind of exciting. Oh, that's fantastic. I'll look forward to that, uh, the digital shopper study on Sylvan. That sounds like it'll be some really good information. Absolutely. Uh, in addition to the resources that Mercatus has, just want to bring everybody's attention to the additional resources from FMI.org. Um, of course, uh, there up in the left-hand corner, it's time for a COVID-19 technology checkup. So uh, FMI published this, and our, our author is right here with us, Gary Hawkins, who wrote the paper. Um, and will be a premise of much of what, what we talk about over the next uh, three to four sessions. Um, in addition to uh, transparency trends um, in an omni-channel grocery shopping environment. So how is that consumer responding to shopping um, in the current state and uh, through the various channels that they have to access that food? Um, as well as a compilation of research um, in our annual FMI boardroom, which is uh, distributed to board members um, at FMI Midwinter on an annual basis. So there's a number of things for, for the attendees to take advantage of and help them uh, meet their needs and, and meet the consumer's needs. So Gary, I'm gonna hand it back over to you and if you could sort of walk us through the issues of the day and get, us, get this uh, discussion sort of set up. Yeah, let, yeah, let's jump in here. So, you know, certainly the COVID-19 crisis has really been a massive stress test for the retail industry and absolutely a stress test for e-commerce systems. Um, and, you know, we quickly saw a number of issues arise from the, the crisis as we entered, you know, a period of lockdowns and, and people couldn't get out and so on. But maybe before we dig into some of the specific issues that we saw arise here, um, you know, everyone has talked about how much online shop, grocery shopping has grown over the last six or seven months here uh, since this crisis has really taken over the country. But let's see if we can put some numbers to that. Uh, so, Van, uh, across the retailers that, that Mercatus powers up, what have you seen that growth look like from, you know, January or before to, you know, where we are today? Yeah, so, so great question. And we, we've seen a growth three to five X from from pre we call it pre March 11th when President Trump addressed the nation so which is part of February and post that three to five x the numbers are remaining depending on the region you are in the country the numbers are remaining stable in some cases we're seeing a small decline in certain markets 
but for the most part, um, sales numbers are through the roof. Yeah, so, so that, that really uh, reaffirms what I've seen in the retailers I've talked to across the country. I've even actually talked to some retailers that were looking at 7 and 8x growth. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, just unbelievable and, and, you know, almost overnight, right? Mm -hmm. So you talk about a stress test. Uh, this has certainly been that. Um, but, but let's dive into some of the specific issues here that, that we saw arise. And again, you know, the, the starting point here are just multiple conversations with retailers of all sizes across the country as we entered the, the crisis period and, and things really began to ramp up. I know one of the things I experienced personally as we began to shop online was frustration with the lack of availability of delivery slots and so on. And I think that was one of the first big issues we saw a lot of retailers uh, run into. Uh, Doug, does that line up with what you heard from, from FMI members? Both personally and professionally, Gary. Um, you know, there was a time, uh, you know, where, you know, I wasn't really wanting to go into a grocery store myself. And so trying to put in an order and, you know, I'd be looking at a window that was anywhere from seven to 14 days out. So that was a real challenge. And, you know, the retailers, um, they were responding as quickly as they could. And a lot of times, you know, they only needed to worry about a couple, two days out. And so you never really even had the use case that required you to consider what type of volume you would receive that would push you out 14 days for a window for somebody to place an order. Um, but it was really a point of contention. And the only way they could address it was by in opening up additional windows, additional slots that extended people out three, four, five, even 14 days, in, in depending on who you were shopping with. Yeah. And so, Van, uh, again, across the retailers that, that you help power up, uh, do most of them uh, provide their own delivery services? Are they relying on third parties? And, and what did you see uh, challenges around this area? Yeah, I think similar similar to what Doug was saying, I think the, the harsh reality is that uh, some retailers were not prepared for the pandemic. So it became a balancing act. How do you manage your labor to do picking and packing for the purpose of a delivery or click and collect versus stocking shelves? And so you're, you're horse trading between those two things. Now, in the case of click and collect, it was a little bit easier for managed. So we were seeing relief in increasing the ability for more orders on a, on a per hourly basis. But when it came to delivery, now a lot of Mercatus' partners rely on Instacart and rely on Shipt. The reality, you're at the mercy of that delivery partner and their ability to scrounge up labor. Yeah, so, so uh, staying on the same topic, uh, again, one of the issues I experienced personally, and this is across several retailers, and uh, so man, none of them uh, Mercatus customers, um, but, you know, what I found was going through the entire shopping process, right? First, finding the products I wanted to buy, putting them in the basket, going through the whole checkout process, payment, delivery information, all of that. And then the last step being told, oh, there's no delivery slots available. Sorry, come back again soon, right? I, I thought that was an absolutely terrible user experience yeah. that negatively impacted on, on these retailers. And I won't name the specific retailers. Um, but, um, you know, I thought there was just a lot that could be done user experience wise here um, to make a better experience. Be because like myself, I think a lot of people begin to shop online for groceries for the first time during this crisis. Mm -hmm. And so a huge opportunity for retailers to deliver a good experience to keep those people coming back. And I think a lot of retailers blew that. Yeah, and you know what, Gary, too, to, to add to that, and you talked about a very good point, is that, you know, the increase of new shoppers online is significant. And I think even for somebody that is an experienced online shopper, they understand the frustration of being a first-time shopper online, right? It's, it's, it's not like walking through a store. You're scrolling through page after page, using the search function to try and find what you want, but you never really having that opportunity to do any kind of impulse purchasing, the things that catch your eye when you're walking through a store. And so that's, a, that's an opportunity that I think 
you know, retailers are going to have to consider in an online environment. As a new shopper, things don't really get good for me until I've gone back to the same place, like maybe the third time. I've started to build a history. I have my profile in the system. I might have a payment system in, in, uh, set up in the system. And then things start clicking. And then I, I can quickly check off the items that I'm used to buying, which gives me more time to look at the items that might be more interesting to me or new items. Um, and I can do a little bit of, uh, you know, experiential searching. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it is a challenge. And, and for many people, that was a frustration for them. It was in some instances, if it wasn't out of a matter of necessity, it would have validated the reasons why they don't want to shop online. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting you say that. So, so what we saw at Mercatus is, first of all, an influx of 33% new shoppers in the stream. Wow. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. Out of, out of that 33%, at least 16% were people over the age of 65. Our call center got flooded with 500% more calls. And, and, and Doug, to your point, these were people over the age of 75 who don't buy online, who are fearful of using their credit card. Credit cards being declined because the credit, credit card company, the bank saying, well, you never buy online with your credit card. This has to be fraudulent. And so now we're having to walk an older user base on the phone for about 45 minutes how to complete a transaction. So, and to Gary's point, you know, the way that we designed our software and our platform in Mercatus is the time, the time slot selections at the end for a various of, of labor calculations. We have to sit down in the room and whiteboard changing that all around, changing the experience. And then we're suddenly we're like, maybe we should turn off certain features on our, on our retailers' websites to make it that much easier for the, for, for the people that are first time users. So there's this complete reinvention that had to happen in call it a week which is unprecedented. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I like to think of as innovation in real time, right? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, uh, understanding very quickly what's happening, where the issues are, and, and uh, you know, Sylvain, you saw this firsthand through your call center with that kind of explosion in calls coming in, uh, you know, quickly identifying where those issues were and then thankfully being able to, to respond to that. Um, you know, one of the, the related issues here was also a lack of product availability information, especially in real time. Um, you know, again, I can relate to this personally, shopping across multiple retailers, you know, not knowing uh, until that item was maybe placed in the basket or not knowing until whatever I ordered showed up at the door what I was actually going to get out of what I had ordered online. Uh, and, and I think that lack of availability, product availability, also comes back into the user experience. Uh, so, man, I'm curious, what are you seeing your retailers doing to try to address that? Yeah, so I think there's, there's some, an openness in allowing companies like Mercatus, Mercatus to connect to some form of real-time inventory system. I think in the, in the reality is two variables greatly affected uh, your experience that you had, Gary. One is panic buying, right? So people going in and taking stuff off the store shelf. That's number one. Number two is online service providers typically get a data feed, call it at least every 24 hours that say, here's what we think is available in the store. And the, what we think is available in the store is a fairly big spread because the reality is there's a, there's a sense of trepidation from retailers wanting to delist a product that's online that they think is no longer available in the store because I may be ordering today, but my expectation is deliveries tomorrow or I'm picking it up in 48 hours. So there's a slight chance when the order's picked and packed that the product may be back in store. Yeah. So now retailers are more open to saying, okay, I think we understand that these two variables combine, combine really led to a poor online experience. So I think we need to start opening up our systems to enable, enable the providers to have access to real-time inventory. Yeah, so completely agree. And, and I, I know from my perspective, uh, more and more retailers seem to be under, or quickly understanding the importance of having that data. You know, today, I, I think it's still a minority and, and 
quite honestly, a small minority of retailers that have real-time uh, inventory data. Um, so that's got to change. Uh, you know, secondly, I think everyone realizes because grocery is such a dynamic environment, uh, trying to maintain that real-time data is challenging, right? That there may be five units on the, the shelf right now, but that could change in the next five minutes just from other shoppers in the store hitting them. Uh, I, so, 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 Van, give me your perspective on this. Do you think that retailers that are operating a dark store or dedicated fulfillment centers and having some kind of, of real-time uh, inventory or product availability data, are they in a better spot to address this than fulfilling out of the live store? Yes. Um, so I recently um, did an evaluation of Sobeys here in Canada that just launched their Voila solution that was built with Ocado. They're fulfilling out of their first CFC that they built in Vaughan, Ontario, costing $96 million to build. Um, and they had it deployed in one city, and within a week, we're able to deploy it um, the greater Toronto area. And from just talking to them and talking to people that work at that warehouse, they're pairing roughly 39,000 products. The visibility in their dot-com is in real time. Their fulfillment issues are, are minimal at best. And their um, order accuracy is trending north of 98%. Wow. 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 So I, I think, so that, that's, that's a great story. Uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot of retailers, I know, that are already assessing you know, how they're going to handle e-commerce going forward, right? And fulfillment either through dark stores, and we saw even Amazon go the dark store route, right? Converting some physical stores uh, over into dedicated fulfillment centers. Uh, I, I know there were some other retailers that shifted uh, online order picking to nighttime when the mm -hmm. store was either closed or much, much quieter to, to help alleviate some of that impact. Um, so a, a lot going on around that space, but I, from my perspective, absolutely an issue that retailers need to address really soon uh, looking forward. Uh, because so then, well, you know, as we opened up, talked about what's happening today and how much e-commerce has grown, I agree with your comment that, you know, it, it may have peaked during the crisis and then has dropped off slightly. Um, my personal take is I, I think that is a temporary thing. I, I think we're going to see e-commerce continue to grow as we go forward here. Uh, so a lot of these issues need to be addressed. Um, Doug, you called out a little while ago when you began shopping online, the, the importance of search capability. And again, this was uh, uh, an area that I saw a lot of retailers grappling with. Um, you know, many of them, uh, a lot of retailers, even larger retailers, um, do not necessarily have a great disciplined product hierarchy that's necessary for search. And even fewer of them really understand the need for expanded product data, data attributes that can power up effective search. So, you know, products that are gluten-free, nut-free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, Van, give us your, your, your take on what you see happening in this space and how big an issue you think this is. Uh, this is the Achilles heel of, of the industry, really, is, is product search. The reality is that, you know, this, there's a lot of historical context that, that Gary and Doug, I'm sure you guys are aware of. The reality is when you're managing data on a mainframe to, to a series of servers to now online is entirely different. And so the, the idea of managing and manipulating your product data on an ongoing basis is still kind of foreign. And even worse than that is, how do you supplement that data with, with even richer metadata? As you said, you know, is it gluten-free? Is it celiac? Is it heart-friendly? And so on. So that, that culture is starting to percolate. And I think this area, I'm kind of really thinking this is going to accelerate, I hope, in the next little while. And what's even more interesting, there is no third, no strong third party out there that focuses exclusively on search. We haven't seen that materialize yet. And I think that's a great opportunity. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, we are seeing some solution providers coming into the market or have been in the market and are growing 
uh, providing expanded product nutrition data and, and some other data points around that. Um, but but I, I agree with your comment. That nobody is really focused purely on search and how to make that you know, most effective. Uh, you know, and Gary, along with that, I, I think um, uh, is, is not uh, uh, understanding the importance of graphics and graphic images here. Does that still continue to be a problem? It's, it's, I will tell you it's better in the last 12 months than it has been in the last 36. Okay, all right, well, progress then. Yes. Yes. Uh, so um, uh, let's move on to the next issue. You know, as as we spoke about here earlier, we saw we've seen uh, online sales growth threefold, fivefold, seven and eightfold in some cases. With that explosion, uh, all of a sudden, online sales are now representing, you know, some significant portion that the retailers need to worry about. When it was still a tiny fraction of total overall sales retailers were not overly stressed or worried about making those online sales profitable. But all of a sudden, when that's a bigger number now, uh, we're seeing every retailer, again, be it a small guy or the big guys, really focused on fulfillment efficiency. Um, I, I know, Doug, we saw literally almost a stampede towards micro-fulfillment center tech uh, to help with that efficiency. Um, uh, what are some of the other things you're seeing, Doug, and, and hearing from retailers? Yeah, well, and you think about, too, um, pre-COVID, <clears throat> the um, average sales per store online was about 3%, really. So for, for many of them, it was, it was more a, a cost of doing business, right? It was providing a platform in order to be able to give the consumer another option in as they become omni shoppers right let's stop looking at it as an omni channel but it's the omni shopper that we're trying to address and so you go from three maybe five percent in urban settings to twenty percent um and it wasn't profitable at three it's even less profitable at twenty um you know so quickly retailers were going to have to figure this out and i don't think it will stay at 20 but we're definitely not going back to three to five so this is going to continue to be a significant line item issue on their PL. and fulfillment um is is the best way to address that and so i think both the good and bad is is covid and the pantry loading time frame really allowed retailers to even probably accelerate some of the testing Right. Being able to take some of the stores to dark in, in certain communities allowed them to actually accelerate their testing of what is the best method for me to be able to fulfill this this platform. And, it, you know, for it might never be one size fits all. You could see, you know, a large multi-state uh, retailer using all three um, from micro fulfillment to customer fulfillment to dark stores. Because um, it really is going to depend where they're at in the country, where their their base is, and what their base needs within within those locales and those communities. Um, so they're looking at everything. I can tell you that there's a few that are accelerating their micro fulfillment builds, and have actually broken ground on on a couple of micro fulfillment centers as they add more of that capacity. Um, but I don't know that we'll ever really see one rise to to the front runner. Yeah. So, so man, what, what are you seeing across uh, your retailers? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is this balancing act between the overall operational process. So is it a CFC? Is it an MFC? Do we fulfill from in-store? And then the tool sets that are using conjunction with those and trying to find the right balance. And I think what's really driving the innovations now is kind of the key words we're hearing, contactless. Um, I don't want to talk to the consumer. I want them to prepay and I just want to put it in the back of their car or I want to deliver it to their front door. So uh, this is I, I, this is kind of interesting. It's led to some extremely, as Doug said, some really rapid innovation and some really people are becoming old, more open-minded and wanting to experiment. Yeah, and uh, the, the other uh, implication I'm seeing arise around all this, and especially re, uh, related to micro fulfillment center tech, is retail is beginning to grasp that there's a, a an implication here for store locations and how they think about store locations and even store design going forward. Right? 
Uh, you know, I've, I know I've talked to a couple of retailers that are hot after MFC technology and thinking about how they design that into a new store, you know, making it maybe a showcase or a centerpiece of a store operation or putting it in the back room, reducing the sales floor area to focus just on fresh products. Uh, but I'm also talking to some other retailers that are taking a, a new look at store locations and as leases be, expire or roll over, you know, thinking through, gee, do I need a new store there or can I drop an MFC in that area to service some handful of stores and change my, my uh, store strategy? And the other thing too, Gary, to think about is that because of COVID, and you mentioned it a couple uh, uh, questions back about product availability, there's a, a sort of a revolution going on in SKU rationalization right now right? Much of it was driven because of the manufacturers um, needing to just produce as much as they can of the core SKUs that consumers were trying to grab and eliminating those tertiary flavors, you know, like, you know, lavender bleach or a smaller size. And so coming out of this, the industry actually through COVID did something that it should have been doing all along. We were over skewed. I think everybody would agree with that. But Boy, you can really understand what a store really needs when you walk through it during the pantry loading days uh, of March and April, because you just look at what's left on the shelf. And if it's yeah. left on the shelf, it must mean that the consumers really didn't want it because they were buying everything else. Yeah. So I think the other thing too is that we've, we've, we're, we're also gonna see this sort of revolution and evolution with, with more streamlined um, SKUs within our stores, which is also going to uh, sort of ramp up the importance of the innovation pipeline. But it's also going to allow retailers to reimagine the store because we've all talked about the fact that when fresh perimeter was taking over and it was really why consumers were going to the store, you know, that it was going to maybe redesign the store. But now we actually are freeing up space that I think will accelerate that and be able to do these micro fulfillments in a very unique way and maybe create theater for the consumer when they're in there shopping the more perishable fresh items. So I, I think that's a great, great point. And I agree with you. Um, you know, I'm seeing the same thing. Retailers really uh, taking a hard look at and rationalizing product assortment and in nearly all cases, reducing that in-store assortment. But does that open the door, Sylvan, to another opportunity for retailers that along the lines of the sort of endless aisle idea that's been out there for some number of years now, you know, while the in-store assortment maybe is reduced, does that mean the retailer can offer a larger assortment online uh, where they can handle it more efficiently? Yeah, I, absolutely. Because the buzzword, you know, back at NRF, in, in, in for those that remember attending in or out at the top of the year, um, the reality is the buzzword was marketplace, where the it's I like to call it the reverse Amazon model. So if you if you have enough traffic to your dot com as a grocery retailer, why not capitalize it and sell other items that you just don't carry inside your store? And there's been some great examples of you know some some retailers right now that have launched marketplaces. And so I think when you look forward with the reimagining of the store and the and integration of an MFC packaging being reimagined as well, I think it's a must if you're a retailer to, to offer those complementary products on your on your website. Specifically, you know, the margins are just there for you to, to take, and that's a great benefit. Yeah. So, so to, to keep us moving here, um, you know, as as online sales blew up really fast through this crisis. Uh, we also saw a number of retailers grappling with simply managing this overwhelming number of orders now, staging them and so on, right? You know, I, I know a number of different stores uh, that I went into, it was quite obvious that they had run out of staging area because they had carts, coolers, things all over the place trying to, to manage and stage orders for uh, customer pickup. What so then, uh, how did you see retailers responding to this? How big an issue do you think this was? This pretty significant issue because historically you'd have locations that weren't doing many transactions on a daily basis and suddenly it's, you know, three, five, ten times uh, the volume that they normally see. So they really had to scrounge for space. I've seen cases where refrigeration uh, trucks were being pulled in. 
kept in the back where orders were being piled inside on, on shelving uh, mm -hmm. for the sake of keeping everything fresh. Wow. Boy, oh boy. Um, yeah. So something, so, so related thing here too, is I heard a, a number of retailers beginning to talk about leveraging location services to help understand when that customer was getting near the parking lot to pick up so they can make that pickup process that much more efficient, keep things moving. Uh, is that something you saw? Yeah, absolutely. So we, in our case, we recently partnered with Flyby Pickup and it's this really great piece, a little, little piece of technology that basically tells the personal shoppers inside the store that, hey, Mrs. Smith, she's X minutes away, she's about to pull into the, into the parking lot or she's parking to a spot, whatever, let's get her order ready. And the reality is that what it does is just el eliminates those friction points and, and enables the store to provide really good customer experience. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then uh, the, the last uh, issue I want to call out here was, uh, you know, as we spoke about earlier, a, a large number of retailers uh, rely on third-party delivery services for, for the home delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, as with everything else around online shopping, we saw those services overwhelmed. Uh, you know, we saw some of them looking to hire thousands of, of new shoppers literally overnight. And, you know, it became pretty evident that there were training issues and so on as they tried to meet demand. As, as things have settled down a little bit into some kind of new normal now, I'm hearing from a, a growing number of retailers more interest in looking at how they can take more control over that last mile of, of delivery. Uh, Doug, what, what are you hearing from, from your members? Yeah, absolutely. They're looking, uh, again, it's similar to the way they fulfill it. It's the last mile. And I remember early on, we were always talking about how the last mile was the least profitable step in the whole activity. Um, and before COVID, uh, you know, we had retailers that were testing various uh, delivery mechanisms uh, from driverless delivery to, you know, um, you know, uh, using third parties to do that delivery. And that, that, that continues today. Um, I think autonomous delivery is, is um, probably going to come upon us quicker than we ever anticipated. And partly because of COVID again, I think, you know, when we come out on the other side of this, there's going to be technologies that are going to accelerate. And because we're going to become a society that really wants less touch and interaction um, for a period of time, and maybe then for good, is we'll see this autonomous delivery activity really, really pick up. And uh, many of the pilots um, that, are, that are happening right now today are um, proving to be beneficial in the areas that they've used them. And so in the meantime, it's gonna be, how do I utilize third parties um, in order to be able to do that process as efficiently as possible? Yeah, and to that point, I think we just saw a story in the news in the last day or two. I think Amazon just received uh, FAA approval for their drone delivery capabilities. Uh, yep. So Van, does that mean Mercatus is going to have its own Air Force here of drones now that uh, your retailers can make use of? I, I uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> what, what uh, uh, any comments around the, those third party delivery services? Uh, uh, how you see retailers sort of grappling with that? Yeah, I, I think that the challenge for them is transparency. And in your surrendering, you know, if you look at the average grocery retailer in the United States, some of them are over 85 years old and, and maybe older. So you've spent a lifetime building a business, multiple generations, and suddenly that, that last moment of experience is in someone else's hands. And that's concerning for, for retailers. Now, you know, Doug is right. The reality is sustainability on, on, from a revenue perspective is likely there today. And that's why they want to take it back so they can really continue having that as an extension of themselves. Transparency is an issue. I think um, where do the, the financial elements lie? What other revenues generating from, from some of their core assets like data and so on um, and, and CPG relationships? I think those are the concerns I'm hearing about that need to be addressed. Okay. Hey, Gary, um, I, have a, I have a question for Sylvan, if I could. Um, you know, Sylvan, you, you've sort of, you've been in the vortex on this, on this whole thing as well and, and, and helping retailers. 
What are, what are um, some of the immediate changes that you're seeing that Mercatus is going to do in a proactive manner um, because of what you've learned over the last five months? What are some of the wholesale changes you guys have already started doing? Yeah, listen, that's a great question. Number one is um, we're, we're working with the U.S. government for the integration of SNAP EBT and SNAP Cash. That is very critical. Um, I think the, the percentage of people in the United States that are using those benefits is high. And, you know, there's data, uh, research out there that's been published as of, as of yesterday that demonstrates that the SNAP EBT basket is larger than the traditional basket. And, and retailers want to support their communities. So that's number one. Number two is what we realize is that to be really good at e-commerce, you need to bring in the right ecosystem partners. So we've partnered with ShopperKit, who has an amazing uh, picker technology that does batch picking, wave picking, so many things that we just don't do in our own technology. So we partnered with them. The third one is we're integrating uh, flybys technology. And I think giving the store the awareness that someone's pulling into the parking lot to get their order uh, ready is fairly significant. The fear, and I think Doug, you know this, the fear for some retailers right now is if we are hit with a really large second wave of COVID-19, could state authorities ask them to close and only operate if they do e-commerce, curbside and delivery. And some retailers are not equipped to do it even today. The, I think the last big bit for us that we're focused on the remainder of, of 2020 is fortification of our technology and taking a very hard look at all of our, third, we have 52 third party integrations into our system and saying which ones are critical to support the retailers moving forward and kind of making those tough decisions and saying, I don't think we need this integration anymore. So that's really, really what we're seeing and focusing. And that's what we're, we're advising our retailers to be focused on as well. Uh, that's, that's great. And I can tell you, um, I, I've, part of my role with FMI is emergency management uh, as well as Chad and, um, those, those conversations happen. It's like, you know, what happens if we really have to shut down? You know, what is the capability of the grocer to be able to feed the public? You know, when the government comes in and steps in during a natural disaster and they do mass feeding, it's in congregate fashion, right? It's not at the same time you're trying to socially distance. So any kind of history that we had about feeding the community uh, was either through a grocery store on their own or through the government in congregate mass feeding. And so there was a lot of conversations going on. What might that look like? So um, I know some of these pilots and these stores going to dark um, and then delivering, just doing curbside right there at the store were very important to understand if the industry would even be able to sustain um, and, and be able to handle that type of business if things were to get that bad. And fortunately, they didn't, and hopefully they won't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think to, to add one of the things that, you know, to when we discuss about the third-party delivery companies um, and just kind of the changes around digital advertising in, in general, you know, dollars flowing into Facebook or Google, we decided to launch a, digital, a native digital advertising network to help our, our retailers capture a share of that market that they normally don't see. And that was, that's something that's we're going to continue to focus on uh, for the remainder of the year as well. Yeah, right. So Doug, as, as we uh, get towards the end here, let's maybe go to the next slide and, and uh, try to focus on a few recommendations here uh, for retailers looking ahead. And I think the, the discussion you guys just had around, you know, what if, you know, something like this happens again, and what if the government were to shut down live stores and, and rely on some type of delivery or click and collect? I mean, boy, that would, uh, if I was still a retailer, that would keep me awake at night. Um, but, uh, you know, let, let's try to leave our, our listeners here with a few things to sort of focus on looking forward here. One of the things we haven't really touched on yet, but so i really interested in your thoughts here, is around subscription replenishment plans, right? We saw some numbers uh, coming out uh, related to Amazon, that Amazon was picking up somewhere around three to four billion a month in incremental revenue and transitioning about a billion dollars of that each month 
over into their subscription and replenishment plans. And, and boy, it would seem like once that goes, it's gone uh, to, to competing retailers. Uh, what, what are your thoughts around this? Yeah, I think it's a natural thing for a grocery retailer to do. I mean, I think the reality is, is pre-March uh, 11th, this was a hot topic amongst the grocery retailers as a, an easy way to predict inventory, cash flow, and so on. That kind of went away with the pandemic, but that's slowly coming back. And I think the reason it's it's coming back is, I think in the, in, in the mind of the consumer, there's this safety mechanism to say, if I think I know I'm going to get this on the first of every month or every two weeks, I think you, you feel good about that and retailers want to really be able to, to do it. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, as, as I thought about all the learning that's come, come out of the, the crisis here in the stress test, I, I sort of came down to these four things that I, I believe retailers should be focused on here moving ahead. You know, the first, uh, as we spoke about, the need for real-time product out of stock data uh, to inform the e-commerce system, um, uh, looking at automation to improve fulfillment costs, a focus on efficiency and profitability, subscription plans like we just talked about, and, you know, more and better data to improve uh, search capabilities. Uh, Doug, from conversations you've had, anything you, you want to add to this? You know, the one thing that I would I would add is, you know, we're as retailers, we try to delight our customers. Um, and so the one thing that I would encourage retailers to continue to think about, too, is that people are getting recipe fatigue, right? We've been making the same thing over and over again. And so we're out searching and looking for, for new things to try. And so if I'm, if I'm working through a, a recipe list and, and maybe I'm doing it on the retailer's website, maybe I'm not, but how can I more efficiently move that from the recipe to a list to the cart? And some of the retailers are out there doing it, but I think we have a real opportunity to expand that so that it really makes that shopping trip efficient for the consumer. I asked a question of, of some individuals and they were actually industry folks, not just typical consumers. So they understand what we're doing for e-commerce in the industry. And I said, where do you go to get your recipes? And they actually told me we Google. And I'm like, well, who's your primary shopper? And they shared who the primary shopper was. And I said, well, why don't you go to their website? And they're like, you know what? We never thought about it. So I think there's an opportunity for the retailers to, to do something. And I don't know if it's because it needs to be branded something sexy or different, you know, than, than the banner on the store. I don't know what that answer is, but it did, it did tell me that we have an opportunity as an industry, as consumers continue to look for help, um, to reach out to them and give them an efficient way of getting that done. Yeah. So, Van? Yeah, my, this is a great list of recommendations. I mean, I go back to Snappy BT online. I think that's really important. Um, yep. I think the other one is, what are the solutions that are out there to protect the associates in, in the industry and make their ability to, to delight the customers um, that much easier, that much safer? I don't have an answer to that, but I think everything that we look now is customer back. So what does it mean behind the scenes and how does that interact with the associates, which I will tell you six to eight months ago, I think we wouldn't have thought that way. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, uh, Doug, Sylvan, thank you for uh, being with us. Uh, Doug, why don't you uh, close us out here? Yeah, no, this was great. Well, I could have spent another hour talking about this. Sylvan, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you sponsoring this, uh, this particular session in our, in our four session, uh, endeavor here. It's actually going to end up being about 14 sessions when we're all done with it. Gary, always appreciate you um, as a co-host and, and your thoughts uh, about technology from your vantage point. So here again is just the schedule. Um, you know, the next one up is going to be contact, contactless shopping, transacting, and delivery, which I think is very timely and, and also a very important topic. And so we look forward to having you guys continue to join us. Um, a retailer that is just getting started, um, you know, and I might not have the infrastructure that maybe a regional, super regional or national has, what would your, what would your recommendation be to that, to that retailer that's, that sees that this is an important, almost table stakes uh, offer for retailers, Sylvan? What do you think? Yeah, the, the approach that we take, um, I like to call it crawl, walk and run. Yeah. And trying to build infrastructure to match a supposed 
you know, volume uh, of orders that you don't know if it will materialize is very difficult. I mean, and I think you know this and you hear this from your members. This could be a pretty capital intensive uh, business, right? When, and, and especially on labor, quite frankly. Um, I recommended for, for some retailers that have reached out to us uh, and, and get this uh, as of late coming, coming out of Kuwait City, out of the Middle East, um, a retailer that owned two locations and they needed to do something. I'm like, just, just put a form up on the website where a person can type their order and the store can print it and fulfill it that way and, and do it over the phone. I mean, that's, that's something that someone that owns one or two grocery stores here in the United States can do quite easily and build out from there. As you see demand grow, as you see the number of use SKUs you put online, uh, build it out from there. And I think Gary would say this. I mean, the, the biggest challenge retailers have is product data. And so you need, if you can't get that right out of the gate, you're just going to disappoint people with the experience. I think you need to start small. Yeah. So I, I would not disagree with that, Sylvain, uh, but I guess I would add to that that I think, you know, in a time of ever faster change and, and tech innovation here, I think it is becoming increasingly risky for retailers and supermarket retailers have traditionally been followers, right? Let somebody else blaze the path, figure it out, and then we'll deploy or we'll follow. I think that's becoming an increasingly risky strategy in today's world. And I, I think that same thought applies to this space. Now, I'll give you an example. I won't name the retailer, uh, but I, I think you know them. You know, there's a significant regional retailer in the US that did not have any online shopping capability um, going into this crisis. Think of what that retailer probably lost in sales during these past six or eight months, you know, as this crisis really took hold, um, in the impact that may have to them going forward. Yeah, that's a good point, Gary. Um, and I'm sure that there's probably going to be a lot of retailers out there that are strongly looking at their options uh, because of COVID-19. So, it, it, absolutely. Yeah. So we did have a question come in while we were chatting on that. And Sylvan, maybe you maybe you have some data on this. I personally don't. But, you know, customers that were frustrated uh, with the lack of ability to redeem coupons on online ordering, many platforms don't allow it. So what have you heard, uh, Sylvan or Gary, um, on customer? Is there a customer frustration? Was that a big issue? Uh, so in a, the research report we're going to be releasing on September 15th, it was cited as a uh, frustration point from some customers. Um, so there's a reason for this is majority of the e-commerce platforms that are out there today do not connect directly to the POS. To the point of uh, of sales system, so the you know we and Mercatus we can easily append a coupon directly to the online order, but unless you have a physical connection to that POS, it will not be truly discounted um, from the final total. And the reality, the way that this works is. The coupon goes to the clearing house. When you go into a store, you physically scan your loyalty card. That's when the coupon, the amount is deducted from your total. So unless unless retailers open up their POS systems to connect to these third-party platforms, uh, this will continue, continue to be a challenge. And I, I think it is a challenge that retailers need to really look at seriously now um, because as we all know, uh, you know, given the current situation that seems to be ongoing, millions of people unemployed, there is a big push today for uh, savings, for promotional activity, and so on. Um, you know, shoppers are going to be expecting and looking for those savings everywhere, including online. So uh, I think that's it's a good issue retailers should focus on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we had another question come in, and I think it was referencing a statement that I made. So, uh, you know, pre-COVID sales were about 3% and now about 20%, but not profitable. Is that the experience that retailers are not making money on e-commerce? And I think, it, uh, you know, in large part, that's a pretty accurate statement. Um, it really depends on how they're managing it. So if you look at the, the supply chain, the fulfillment end of that process, 
um, you, it, it shows you there's multiple ways. One, I can have a person picking in store. That's human labor. That's the most expensive of, of any of those f fulfillment uh, methodologies. Uh, then you have micro fulfillment, which reduces the cost. Um, then you have to consider, I need to get it from the store to the curb or to the home. And then the costs go back up. So if I'm going to the curb, it's a little bit less cost. If I'm delivering it to the home, then the costs go back up. So uh, e-commerce profitability um, has been a challenge and continues to be a challenge. Um, but the, um, the retailers or many retailers are piloting many different uh, avenues to in order to make that more profitable from uh, automation, um, both in the fulfillment as well as in the delivery mechanism. So um, Gary, what else have you been seeing? No, I, I, I think you summed it up pretty well. Um, you know, uh, I think nearly all retailers are struggling with profitability. And even the, the rare exceptions that may say they're profitable today, they're not profitable enough, right, given the percentage of total sales online now represents. Uh, so, you know, Doug, as you know, and we've seen massive rush towards looking at automation, um, and we're also seeing a lot of new innovation rushing into the industry right now. Certainly around micro-fulfillment, uh, we're seeing some things with augmented reality and smart glasses to improve picking efficiency in the store uh, and other things. There, there's some really neat stuff going on right now. Okay, cool. Uh, Sylvan, we got one more here, and I think we got about 60 seconds to answer it. I don't know if you want to try and take a stab at it. Do retailers have a desired share of online ordering versus in-store trips? Spend to manage that profitability challenge, and if there is, is there is there an appropriate split? Do you know? No, there isn't right now, but I know the majority of the retailers are really considering what this metric will be. Yeah, I, I can tell you that, you know, we, we want shoppers to get food wherever they want, but we also don't want to teach them how to leave the store, <laughs> right? The store is a very important asset of that retailer. And so it's also about how do we manage the in-store experience with technology and making consumers' lives easier and more efficient so that online just becomes an option when I need to use it for the matter that I need to use it for. And I think, uh, you know, that last question really sort of touches on what is that formula? And, and uh, I imagine many retailers are trying to figure that out right now. Yeah. And I, I think we're going to see is, is in-store continues to sort of fuse together with the online digital experience. Uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things happening around store design in bringing these two worlds together that previously have been thought of as two separate things, these things are gonna to merge together. And I think we're gonna see a lot of innovation around store design, how you shop, the, the whole process. Yeah, yeah, great point, great point, Gary. Well, we're at the top of the hour, and like I said, I could go for another hour, and, and I really appreciate everybody sticking around. That's been fantastic. Uh, thank you for the conversation, Sylvan. Um, and Gary, again, you're always a, a great host, co-host. Um, you make me look good. Um, and everybody, we're going to have another one of these on Thursday, uh, same bat channel, same bat time. And uh, so, so come and join us again when we talk about uh, contactless uh, transaction and shopping. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.